I had about 200 stitches from the waist down. I heard later that the, no women had ever ridden the whale. For 50 years, SeaWorld was the go-to place for killer whale action. The aquatic park continuously brought in new orcas, making the Shamu show a must-see for anyone visiting the park. But in 2016, SeaWorld began to close up shop on their killer whale breeding program. Due to multiple decades of people bringing to light the bad health of killer whales in captivity, but one notable incident sparked this new change to the park. Originated in 1971 with the first human incident involving orcas in captivity, a young SeaWorld PR secretary by the name of Annette Eckes was riding on the back of the park's beloved orca, Shamu, as part of a film publicity stunt, when suddenly she slipped off the whale and into the water. Shamu quickly turned on her, biting down on a leg and refusing to let go, leaving Annette screaming for her life as the three-ton orca was hell-bent on bringing her down. This is the horrifying story of Annette Eckes, the first person to be attacked by an orca in captivity. Annette Eckes was a curious child, but as she got older, her life took meaning when she got to work as a secretary at SeaWorld. She didn't only want to work with people, she wanted to help animals as well. In 1971, she was talked into being a part of the publicity stunt. She was supposed to ride a captive orca in a bikini, but it all went down horribly and it was remembered as one of the worst orca attacks ever. Shamu, a southern resident killer whale, was born in the J-Pod around 1961. Growing up, she spent her days with her family with a diet mainly consisting of salmon. Every summer, she and her mother joined the annual Super Pod gathering with other southern residents. In 1965, aquarium owner Ted Griffin having acquired a killer whale named Namu, sought to capture another one. On October 31, 1965, Shamu and her mother were spotted in Puget Sound by Griffin's capture team, and they decided to try and seize them. The chase lasted over 17 hours, and the whales were eventually netted in Henderson Bay on November 1st. Tragically, Shamu's mother died during capture. After being captured, Shamu was separated from her mother at just the shy age of four years old. This was very stressful for her, especially at that age, as orcas are social beings and have deep connections with other orcas. Now all alone, she was moved to Namu's winter pen, and they eventually tried to connect them. But incompatibility with Namu led to her being put up for sale. Ted Griffin landed a deal and sold her to SeaWorld, which was then recently a new marine park in San Diego and they were desperate for a main attraction. They bought her for $75,000, and it was here that the orca was named Shamu due to her connection or lack thereof to Namu. She made history as the first killer whale to travel by airplane and arrived at SeaWorld San Diego on December 20th, 1965. SeaWorld hit the jackpot when they got their hands on Shamu. She wasn't just a whale, she was the start of something big. In years that followed, SeaWorld went on a killer whale shopping spree, bringing in hundreds of them from all over the world to multiple marine parks. They captured them in the wild, and when that became illegal, they started breeding them in captivity. Chamu's arrival at SeaWorld marked a turning point for the park. Housed in a small pool near Dolphin Lagoon, she shared space with a Pacific white-sided dolphin named George. Chamu quickly adapted to performing and became a star of the show named Shamu Goes Hollywood. It all went well. People came to watch Shamu, and nobody could have possibly predicted the incident that would unfold in just a couple of years. Their orca shows were growing in popularity, so much so that in 1967, two male Southern residents, Ramu and Kilroy, were also caught and transferred to SeaWorld. Ramu was the older one and was immediately put together with Shamu. Kilroy, being younger, didn't join them immediately. However, by 1969, he moved in with them. In 1969, the first major problem occurred when all three whales contracted the Hong Kong flu, but with antibiotics, they eventually recovered. Shamu, as observed during her performances, reflected a mix of intelligence, curiosity, and adaptability. While her life in captivity raised ethical concerns, 
Many acknowledged her unique qualities and the bond she formed with her trainers. The complexities of her personality underscored the challenges faced by marine animals in artificial environments. In December 1971, SeaWorld introduced Kandu to the mix, a female whale captured with Ramu and Kilroy. Kandu was the young orca that was supposed to take the reins and be a star. She immediately got attention from trainers, and now Shamu didn't have to be the sole main attraction anymore when Kandu grew a bit more mature. But this is when things got complicated. Due to poor living conditions, Kandu passed away just a few months after she was introduced to SeaWorld San Diego. She was sick for about a month before passing due to pneumonia and stomach ulcers. After Kandu died, they knew something had to be done for the killer whale, so they designed a new pen. In May later that year, Shamu was moved to SeaWorld's newly built killer whale stadium, costing $1.5 million. Ramu took over her old habitat for some time for training purposes, but eventually joined Shamu in the new stadium shortly thereafter. Throughout her life at SeaWorld, Shamu was involved in various waterworks and performances. She showcased remarkable intelligence and adaptability, captivating audiences with her agility and grace. While Shamu's life was marred by the controversy surrounding captive marine animals, her behavioral incidents were mainly confined to her interactions with other whales and the challenges of adapting to captivity and being moved relatively often. Only a month after Shamu got a new and improved habitat, the difficulties started to kick in. On April 19, 1971, something went awry during a publicity stunt involving Shamu and 22-year-old Park PR secretary Annette Eckes. The plan was for Eckes to ride on Shamu's back while wearing a bikini. However, things took a turn when Shamu's tail started fluttering, which is a sign of agitation. After just one lap around the pool, she made Annette slip off and that's when things got intense. Shamu bit into her leg and held on tight. It took a trainer using a pole to pry Shamu's mouth open and free Annette from her jaws. She was soon rushed to the hospital, needing between 100 and 200 stitches, and the incident left her with both physical and mental scars. Some say that Shamu's unusual reaction might have been triggered by the bikini Ekis was wearing. You see, Shamu had only been used to swimming with trainers in wetsuits, this wasn't the first time Shamu acted aggressively towards people in swimsuits. She had a history of showing similar behavior towards a swimsuit model and even a SeaWorld trainer. To make matters more concerning, Shamu had been acting strangely since March of that year. Annette recalls the incident vividly to this day. She was basically sitting on Shamu's bottom jaw with the teeth on her thighs. She was hanging on to the top of her head for the most of it. There was a lot of blood, but surprisingly there was no pain. The water was cold and Annette was in shock for quite a while. She had to grab onto the wall and hold on for dear life as she was terrified that Shamu would dive and go down. In 2010, she was a brief guest on Larry King after more recent orca attacks, where she described the incident in far greater detail. She described working as a secretary at SeaWorld San Diego when she was asked to do this stunt for promotion to change the whale from a smaller tank to a larger tank and so there was news media there at the time. She doesn't know why Shamu attacked her except the theory that she had heard that no one had ever ridden an orca without a wetsuit and no women had ever interacted with Shamu. Shortly after the attack, it was discovered that Shamu was pregnant. This is also what might have caused her aggression towards Annette. While not officially confirmed, it was also certain that the father was Ramu. Unfortunately, the joy of Shamu's pregnancy was overshadowed by the tragedy. On Sunday, August 29, 1971, Shamu passed away and with her, her unborn calf. The cause of death was pyrometra, a severe uterine infection that can be life-threatening. Pyrometra often occurs due to hormonal imbalances, specifically fluctuations between estrogen and progesterone. During pregnancy, increased progesterone levels can lead to the thickening of the uterine lining providing an ideal environment for bacterial growth. As the infection progressed, bacteria entered her bloodstream, causing septismia. This led to a widespread inflammation and organ failure. Shamu's death marked the end of an era, as she was the first killer whale to be captured intentionally for live display and become an iconic figure at SeaWorld. But her demise did not halt the shows at SeaWorld. 
SeaWorld San Diego announced that Kilroy would continue with the performances despite everything that had happened. Shamu's life included not only moments of awe during performances, but also instances of unpredictability and tragedy. The incident with Annette Eckes shed light on the challenges of interacting with killer whales in captivity, and Shamu's pregnancy and subsequent death revealed the delicate nature of life in a marine park setting. But her legacy extends beyond her time at SeaWorld. Her name has become synonymous with killer whales in captivity, serving as the stage name for subsequent orcas at SeaWorld. The debate surrounding the ethics of keeping killer whales in captivity gained momentum in the aftermath of Shamu's life, shaping public perception and influencing marine mammal regulations. SeaWorld did try to distance itself from the name Shamu due to the tragedy, but it stuck around and they had to embrace it. Shamu's name isn't just a name, it's a brand. SeaWorld made Shamu a superstar and her legacy lives on as the trademark stage name for all of SeaWorld's killer whales. It was everywhere, on merchandise, in shows, park locations, video games, and in advertisements. Shamu became a symbol for SeaWorld despite passing away. It's interesting, though, that the character of Shamu took on a bit of a twist. Shamu, despite being female, was often shown as a he. In 2004, SeaWorld even released a video game called Shamu's Deep Sea Adventure, where Shamu, the male character, had to save SeaWorld from Poseidon and the Kraken, SeaWorld really ran with the Shamu theme. The killer whale shows had Shamu in their names, like Shamu Rocks America in the Shamu Adventure. The stadiums where the massive shows were held were called the Shamu Stadium for a long time. And at long last, in 2016, SeaWorld noticed a shift in public opinions on orcas and finally ended their orca breeding program due to a combination of strong protests, many enormous sponsorship cancellations, and a celebrity wave of criticism. It all started from backlash due to the 2013 documentary Blackfish, and the orcas currently in captivity will be the last generation to perform. Should SeaWorld have halted live orca shows prior to Annette's incident? How does such bad care towards animals go unnoticed for decades? Our opinions are reserved, but maybe another orca attack story could answer these questions. <laughs>